Hello and welcome to Veterans Remember. I'm Dick Gooding, your host for Veterans Remember, where we have the opportunity to meet with veterans, uh, local veterans who have uh, various experiences, both war and peacetime, and uh, who are uh, sharing that with us uh, through these series of discussions. Uh, today, we're lucky to have Bill Newell, who is a Marine, and notice I didn't say former Marine because I realize you Marines are sensitive, uh, who's a Vietnam War veteran and who ha had a, a very significant experience involving the fall of Saigon, which he's going to share with us today. Uh, so, Bill, welcome to Veterans Remember. We appreciate you coming in to join us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for uh, inviting me in. Yeah. Well, Bill, uh, you you live in Hopkins and have lived here for a number of years, but you uh, you grew up outside of town. Maybe you can uh, bring us back a little bit and explain uh, a little of that. Sure. I, I uh, was born in Brockton, um, spent uh, my younger years in Brockton, and then my high school years in Bridgewater. Uh, my mother worked for the school cafeteria at the high school there, and my dad was uh, worked for the Brockton Taunton Gas Company. And uh, it was a nice town to grow up in, much like Hopkinton. Uh, at the time, they were uh, in the early 60s, 70s, uh, early 60s, probably only about 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. That's a nice town. Yeah. How long have you lived in Hopkinton, Bill? Uh, now probably 10, 11, maybe 12 years. And you live down on Lake Maspinock? I live on a lake, yeah, oh, on Downey Street. That's a yeah. beautiful area of town. It is, yeah, we like it. Yeah. Bill, how did you get into the Marines? And tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, uh, I graduated from Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School in 1972. And um, uh, all of my uncles and uh, both sides, my mother's side and my father's side, had served in the military. So even though it wasn't the most popular thing to do uh, at that, in that era, um, I volunteered to go in the Marine Corps. It was, uh, for me, it was what my uh, uncles did, and, and uh, so many of them being in the Air Force and the Navy uh, and the Army, uh, it was just what, what uh, was the right thing for me to do. Hmm. And, and uh, you, you got involved with a very elite unit uh, of the Marines. Maybe mm -hmm. you could go into that and explain the the uh, uh, the unit that you were in? Sure. Um, I uh, went down to Paris Island uh, in the summer of 72. Um, I came out of Paris Island, uh, top of my class, was meritoriously promoted, went to Camp Lejeune, spent about a year and a half at Camp Lejeune, and then um, applied for a special Marine Security Guard duty in Washington. And uh, to my surprise, I was accepted. Ended up going to a school in uh, Washington um, and uh, was um, uh, and within three months was assigned to uh, a post overseas and and uh, the way that the, the whole duty tour worked we we uh, were schooled in, in State Department uh, organization and structure security procedures and so forth and then um, uh, we trained at the FBI Academy all of our weapons training was there and then what they did is they signed uh, the Marines, it was a very elite group, it was about a 35% attrition rate. They then assigned the graduates to different posts throughout the world. And uh, the deal was if you took a hardship post, uh, that you would only have to serve at that post for a year and then you'd have your choice of anywhere else in the world you wanted to go because the total, total tour was two years. So um, I sort of took the, the gambit and um, essentially uh, uh, decided that I would I would volunteer for Vietnam, so I spent a short uh, detail with the Secret Service at the United Nations, and then I uh, was flown over to Saigon, uh, Vietnam, and arrived on May 5th of 1974. So in 1974, uh, the U.S. involvement in hostilities had had wound down. Is that correct? That is correct. All offensive troops had left Vietnam at that time. Um, the United States was trying to uh, politically wind the whole affair down. Uh, but um, the hostilities, even though the Paris Peace Accords were signed in 73, the hostilities between the North and the South were still, um, they were still engaged. And so... Um, and in they, many respects, it was probably greater involvement with, uh, with direct combat at that point in time than there was when the U.S. was there. To some degree. I mean, the reason why they wanted us there was because we needed to provide security for American uh, defense attache personnel, uh, State Department personnel, and um, uh, facilities and classified um, information and facilities that were there. So 
you know, that's so I arrived on May 5th, and, and that's what we did. We essentially provided security for USIS, which I always thought was kind of a cover for the CIA, uh, US, uh, United States Aid for Internal Development, USAID, uh, Ambassador Graham Martin and his wife at his compound, and then the U.S. Embassy itself. Um, and, um, you know, it was, it was pretty routine work, really. Well, uh, as I understand it, Bill, it went from anything but, or anything but routine uh, as the days wound on. Perhaps you can uh, share a little bit of that information with us. Well, um, I, I was just thinking, as you said that, I think I probably got into more than I had bargained for. I was actually thinking when I volunteered not to be a hero, but I was thinking hardship post, choice of anywhere else in the world, what a great opportunity, thinking that it was post-war Vietnam. But around halfway through my tour, around January of 75, um, there was, uh, I think, probably a clear indication on the North Vietnamese side that the United States was not going to provide any more pol uh, military or financial aid to South Vietnam. And they began to look at that as an opportunity to reunify the company, the reuni reunify the country, um, and began a, a very large-scale offensive at that time. So, and, and that was for the most part outside of Saigon proper. It was up in the I Corps, Two Corps, and Three Corps areas. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. They they uh, they eventually came across the DMZ. Um, they uh, took Bami to it. Um, then they. Um, uh, eventually took away, which as you know, being a former Vietnam veteran yourself, was uh, essentially an area that um, was the former um, capital of right. Vietnam. And then went and uh, took Da Nang and then Pleiku, the Central Highlands, and then uh, at that point uh, things really started to kind of deteriorate both politically and uh, militarily for the South. So. I, I know that you have uh, uh, some pictures that you're going to share with us and, and narrate a little bit. Yeah. And you also, uh, as you're explaining the uh, uh, the North Vietnamese sort of closing in, uh, I know you've got a pretty nifty map. Uh, and since I'm an old map guy, yeah. uh, maybe you could uh, show us uh, what the situation was like before it really uh, started to get dicey for you. Sure. Um, if I, If we look at the map here... Uh, before I go to some of the pictures, um, if you can see the uh, map here. Uh, so t to narrate, around um, probably March of 75, the uh, North Vietnamese had 16 divisions converging on Saigon. President Tu decided that he was going to try to consolidate his forces, because remember, all the aid from the United States was denied. So he had very little support from the US at that point, whereas the communists still had the support of communist China and Soviet Union. So around March, when the offensive really took hold, they came down through the Central Highlands and then they began to encircle Saigon. And as you can see here, these are actually the battle lines. Um, and this, is, uh, this, this picture here is actually blown up from um, uh, Butler's book on the fall of Saigon, and uh, it, it essentially pictures Saigon, uh, the airport at Tonsonut, and um, essentially the battle lines here. And around the city, these 16 divisions are somewhere, and I've read different numbers, but somewhere apparently are around 100,000 troops assembled to then come down by, on Saigon. By this time, the rest of the country had already uh, fallen. Uh, fallen to the North Vietnamese. Yes, there's ar there had already been an exodus. Um, th there were some very large-scale events going on at the time. Um, the uh, major highways that were coming down from the Central Highlands were clogged up with um, South Vietnamese forces trying to get south, um, and those uh, forces were... Uh, and I assume a lot of refugees as well. A lot of refugees. Um, I mean, it was really tragic. It was in, in the history books refer to it as the Trail of Tears, where there were so many of these troops that were slaughtered on the way down, and, um, and, the, and the refugees were just trying to make their way, and uh, helicopters were trying to take them out. People were trying to get on the helicopters. There was just chaos on the way down. And the chaos uh, spread into Saigon, I assume, fairly fairly quickly, or was or could well, you we see were, it coming? We were, well, no, we were, actually, we were being 
because of our position, there were only 50 of us that were assigned to the embassy in Saigon. So we were constantly being... 50 Marines, 50, all Marines? 50 Marines, right. Um, and, and we were constantly being briefed by the CIA as to these movements because obviously we had the, the, the mission of the, we, were, we had the charge of protecting the, not only the facilities but the personnel who were still there. And so um, as this all developed, the CIA's position on this probably around March was we don't think that um, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese will be successful, that they'll probably stop reorganize and then maybe continue this um, later on in the year in the dry season uh, but they, they, they essentially there was a vacuum and they just kept on coming and uh, so uh, as we uh, as they got closer um, we experienced it uh, I mean I can remember at night we'd be uh, on our at our posts and at night you could actually see literally the tracer exchange the the firefights going off um, you know, at a distance of maybe 10 miles or so. Um, and then uh, we started getting um, um, bombed by, uh, uh, we had uh, enemy aircraft bombing the city. Uh, enemy aircraft? We, we had, um, what happened at one point when, the, when the, the, the Vietnamese came down through the Central Highlands, they took Pleiku, and apparently, um, uh, you know that they were able to uh, commandeer some A-37s from the uh, from Play Coup, which had South Vietnamese designation on it, and were able to fly into South Vietnamese airspace around the city, and um, literally um, dropped uh, some some bombs on the uh, on the palace uh, and uh, the the airstrip at Tonsonut, and then as they got closer and closer, we experienced um, uh, big uh, big uh, artillery. It was being fired into the into Tonsonut. I think the North Vietnamese, uh, their feeling was that they wanted to render, uh, you know, strategically render that airport um, unusable by uh, just shelling the the runways. And so, what what then took place was that the the um, the evacuation at, at at one point could then no longer be executed from the airport, where the entire uh, yeah. plan was to execute the evacuation if we got to that point from the airport, um, but at, at a point, um, we were just taking too much fire out there. We lost two Marines out there with, that, uh, from RPG. Um, and Tanzanut was the largest uh, U.S. or military air base, as I recall, uh, you know, from my days in Vietnam. It was, and, it was and, a, and certainly where you expected to have everyone leave from, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that would be the, the best embarkation point, mm -hmm. uh, the best facilities to stage, and the best facilities to, uh, to move people onto aircraft and get those aircraft out of there. And, uh, you know, the, the numbers are, are really quite large. I mean, I've, I've heard numbers from 6,000 to 10,000 people in the last few days were evacuated from that zone. But at, at a point... Um, Americans you're talking about now? Or, well, or? no, Americans and Vietnamese. I mean, you yes, had... Sir. A lot of um, you had a lot of defense attaché personnel there, which were left over post peace accord. Um, you had uh, a lot of uh, State Department people who were there, um, and you also had a lot of American contractors who were there. Um, I think Michelin was there, Shell was there. Um, you know, they they operated uh, from around that area, um, and uh, of course there were a lot of Vietnamese facilities, South Vietnamese facilities that were there as well. Um, but it was a very large area, and there was, um, you know, there was a lot of air operations going on. Yeah. At the time, uh, were you and the 50 of, of you at the at the embassy in the embassy area? Mm -hmm. You weren't receiving fire on a daily basis directly into the embassy. Not into the embassy. We were. It was happening around us. So um, uh, there was a few nights where we had some rocket attacks that came into the city itself. You know, a few streets away. Um, you know, took some rocket hits. Um, the airport got hit very hard. Um, eventually, we had to just close up shop at the airport and move everything uh, to the uh, to the American had embassy. Had the intent? Uh, could they have targeted the embassy with the, the the heavy artillery that they had? Had they intended to? Uh, Absolutely, they uh, were. They so, were so, in range. So they really weren't initially. Uh, uh, firing to blow up our embassy at, the, at that no, point. No, on the contrary. I think yeah. I think politically, the North Vietnamese understood the value of leaving a window 
or a corridor for the Americans to exit. So they, they didn't want a re-intervention uh, of, of forces. I mean, we had, this, we had the Seventh Fleet off the coast. That's where all the, all the evacuation aircraft were coming from. The fixed wing were coming from, I think, Clark uh, Air Force Base. I think in the, is that's in the Philippines. Philippines, yeah. yeah. And, um, and Guam. Uh, but the helicopter, all, all the rotary wing aircraft were coming off of the ships, and they were flying into the... Uh, into the uh, into Tunsanut, yeah. but one big hit was they they, uh, they they hit a 130, a C-130 out on the air base, and that that just completely uh, disabled the last airstrip. Well, as things were really getting uh, uh, dicey for you, I know you've got some great uh, pictures in there. Perhaps you can share sure, yeah, yeah. share some of these pictures with the with the um, audience. Yeah, I can uh, just hear. Um, let's see here. Um, they may not be in order, but just to sort of get through this. Um, these are pitch, this is pictures of the assembly points of just people just trying to um, get their um, uh, their their uh, permits, um, their visas stamped and so forth to get out. Uh, this is taken from the roof of the embassy, um, whereby you can see uh, there's just a uh, you know a, a, just a big mess down below. Um, reason being the. Um, the, the, for, the South Vietnamese forces were decimated on the way down. Um, they were never able to really reorganize it. Swan Lock they held for a little while, but um, I mean they, they were really literally uh, rendered um, uh, impotent. They, they just they couldn't, they couldn't hold their territory. So those forces came down into Saigon. So our biggest fear was that at first if, if we were uh, too quick to get out of those zones, then we would have uh, 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 people trying to get over our walls, and eventually that's what happened. Sure. They realized we were leaving, and we got down to uh, hitting people with uh, rifle butts. We didn't want to shoot anybody because we had all of these uh, deserters, uh, these Arvin, who were out in the streets along with all of the other refugees um, who were desperate to get out, thinking that they were going to be. So not only were the North Vietnamese uh, compressing into the city of Saigon, but the Arvin soldiers were all coming that way too to escape the, the Ab onslaught. Absolutely. So these are pictures of the CH-46s, which were coming down on the roof on the helo pad. These are the big, uh, the heavies, the uh, CH-53s were coming down into the parking lot. So we get down to the last couple of days of this evacuation, we had to stop all operations out of Tonsonut, and we had to move all the operations, which was not the plan, to the embassy compound itself. So there was a big, big tree in the middle of the parking lot, and it was a tamarind tree. So we, we had that cut down, and we had to move that tree out of the way with a, with a big uh, fire tanker truck. And uh, so we, that was moved out of the way. And then that's where the, the CH-53s came down into the, the lot. Um, all the people around were staged uh, in the uh, sublots of the embassy compound. And um, what we did was um, essentially evacuate them uh, from those zones. And this is, this is what's left of that afterwards uh, let's, here. Let's hold on on the, some sure. of those pictures, because yeah, I yeah. think that, that uh, really shows, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for our, our audience, shows some of the chaos that was going on uh, during those last, sure, yeah. I guess, days. And mm -hmm. I don't know when you get down to hours, but uh, right, right. I guess during the last days. So uh, what, what ultimately happened was we're now evacuating from the embassy compound. And um, then the order was given that there was only going to be so many helicopters left. So now we're in the, 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 uh, the early morning hours of April 30th, and there's, uh, we had, we had, they had brought in the 8th Marine Amphibious Brigade. So we had about 130 Marines come in in the last 24 hours to help us hold the walls. They came in, uh, and then we got everybody out that we could. And then what happened was we um, formed a couple of lines outside of the, 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 the main entry doors of the embassy. And then uh, we um, entered into the building. Uh, and at that point, the Vietnamese who were staged to go realized they weren't going. The walls had not been maintained, so people had, were coming over the walls. We went into the embassy. We literally. Uh, at the doors were um, kicking and, and uh, rifle butting people trying to get in those doors. We finally got the doors secured. We went up the stairwells. There's about six or seven 
floors in the embassy. We got to the embassy. You've got some shots of the <coughs> of the embassy uh, where they landed, I think. On yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, no, there was here somewhere. Um, yeah, maybe maybe back. You got some before there. Yeah, maybe here. Let's see. Um, let's see where we are. The, some of those pictures are actually from the wall. I, I, there yep, you go. There we go. Yep. So this is us up on the roof here. So that's where the where the helicopters landed on those uh, bottom two photos. They landed right on right on there, and then what? Yeah. Twenty to thirty would get in, in into a, a yeah. Helicopter. You could get 30, 35 people into because at this point we were leaving only with our rifles and our ammunition. Um, so you could get a few more troops into those forty sixes. Now there was a blockhouse on the embassy roof. So at the top of the blockhouse was the helo pad. Down below here is where we're all staged. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're, we're flying off the top here. Um, the helicopters are coming in. So at around 3.30, 3 4 o'clock in the morning, the helicopters stopped coming in. And there's now a, uh, about half of our support troops left and ourselves. And the, 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 the commander's decision was that we would be the last to leave the embassy because it was our embassy and that's what we needed to do. We had the flag and everything. Why did they, why were they stopping sending in uh, helicopters? Was it because the, the North Vietnamese were getting into such a... Uh... No, no, they, they actually thought that the Blue Ridge was a command ship on the 7th Fleet, thought that the operation was over, that they had gotten everybody out. We had burned all the communication gear. You know, what we had to do is we had to burn all the classified, we had to burn, we build, burn, burned millions and millions and millions of, of dollars, uh, American currency. Uh, we had to smash all the communications gear. We had to burn the crypto rooms. All those things had to be destroyed. So now we're left up on the roof and we're thinking that they're coming and they stopped coming and we were the last to go. So. Uh, we waited about two hours hmm. on the roof before a reconnaissance plane apparently saw the remaining Marines on the roof. And, uh, you know, I, I can remember sitting up there thinking to myself, oh, That's Jesus, it. They you know. just left us behind. No, huh? I'm, thinking, I'm thinking, you know, they're just, all they have to do is shell us and it, it's gone where it's over. Or we're going to be, uh, is it going to be the Alamo and we're all going to die? Or we're going to become POWs or political prawns and, and the big scheme of things. So it was a very, very, those last few hours when we had nothing to do, uh, honestly, I mean, and, it was a very little, scary little time. little to no communications to, no. Uh, to the outside. Uh, a, a reconnaissance jet came in. Apparently they saw uh, the remaining Marines on the roof. They radioed back. They scrambled a couple more helicopters. Um, the, uh, the Marine Amphibious Brigade went out first, or the remaining guys. Then um, we went out, um, the last helicopter went out at 7.55, the morning of April 30th, and I was on the helicopter before that. The last helicopter had 11 Marines in it. Um, I was in the 46 prior to that. Mm. And, uh, and then we went out to the Hancock, and then there's all those other pictures of, you get out to the yeah, Hancock. some of the pictures of, uh, of, yeah. of some of the boats, uh, uh, ships oh, yeah, that I mean, were uh, evacuating uh, Vietnamese, I, I know. Uh, they were, the, the idea there was to, was to really, uh, once the evacuation stopped, then what people were trying to do, because they thought that they were going to be slaughtered, um, you know, it's, it's funny to say that, but, but there was that sort of mentality that the North were going to come down and they were going to do essentially what the Khmer Rouge did to the Cambodians. And that had only happened a month before. So anything that was seaworthy, anything that was airworthy was leaving the mainland. So out on the Hancock, um, the, the small boats were heading to the South China, to the uh, Seventh Fleet. And on the Hancock, when I finally got there, I remember getting off the aircraft and the first thing they did was they disarmed us. And then we're standing around, it's a gray day, we're looking around and now, Helicopters are coming in, they're landing on the aircraft carrier deck, and what they're doing is they're offloading, and then they're pushing the helicopters off the aircraft carrier deck into the sea. It's a very surreal scene yeah. of all of this taking place. And this was, uh, and this was what, to, to get, get rid of the weight uh, right. and, the, the, and leave the, space for The for fleet people. came in with American aircraft, mm -hmm. and they had room for American aircraft. Now, the Hancock had 1,500 refugees in the hangar deck. So there was no room for helicopters in the hangar deck. That was all, it was a sea of humanity. On the aircraft carrier deck, 
um, they had only enough room for their own helicopters. So wow. uh, that was the scenes where the helicopters come in and the guy jumps out one side and the yeah. helicopter goes in the sea. I mean, we were watching that going, Jesus, this is... Bill, this has been a fascinating story and I know it was a very harrowing time for you and, and for American uh, military history. Yeah. Uh, in our final couple of minutes, I wonder if you could sort of... Uh, uh, reflect back on on that experience now and and give it some meaning to us in uh, in real time today well i first of all i'd say you know i would I, even though i lost uh, you know two good friends and two other guys i didn't know that well there um, and it was it was a very uh, it was it was a very scary experience essentially i would never i would wouldn't give up any of those memories i, I would i would never give that up um, it was the Marine Corps was good for me. I mean, I went in at 17. Um, it was my ticket out. I mean, my 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 socioeconomic vehicle out of where I was in life. My parents and uh, and and uh, you know I get out of the Marine Corps. I get out of sergeant. Um, I went on to take the GI Bill. Uh, you know, I, I uh, ended up getting a couple of degrees and and um, you know and uh, here I am living in Hopkinton. You know. Well, your story is yeah. fascinating, and uh, I'm sure that, that all of our audience is uh, going to appreciate it, and we appreciate you spending the time with us today. Uh, uh, this is Sergeant Bill Newell, uh, Marine. I'd say former Marine, but uh, you're never a former Marine, and uh, Bill's experience at the fall of Saigon was something that uh, uh, I hope that everyone will remember. And uh, uh, I want to thank everyone for watching uh, for this edition of Veterans Remember. And uh, Bill Newell joined us, and we're very pleased to have heard his, his experiences. And for all of you uh, young children out there, I hope you have the opportunity to talk with veterans. Uh, we've had World War II veterans. We have Vietnam, Vietnam veterans. We have Korean War veterans. Uh, their experiences are significant and have helped shape uh, the life for each one of us. Once again, this is Dick Gooding, and thank you very much for joining us on Veterans Remember.